Part 9. Consecration. It might be good to stress several points here. First, never was a believer brought into healthy spiritual maturity by means of pressure meetings and constant exhortations, nor before he was prepared by the Holy Spirit. Second, healthy progress is based on the apprehension, understanding and appropriation of the truths in Christ that make for real growth. Third, the experiential aspect of all truth, and especially these so-called deeper truths, is closed to all but the needy heart. Until one is aware of his need to progress spiritually, he'll never be brought beyond the birth truths, a mere babe in Christ. Therefore, let us go on and get past the elementary stage in the teachings and doctrines of Christ, the Messiah, advancing steadily towards the completeness and perfection that belongs to spiritual maturity. Let us not again be laying the foundation of repentance and abandonment of dead works or dead formalism and the faith by which you are turned to God. That was from Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1, the Amplified Version. This subject of consecration seems to be badly misunderstood by so many believers. Many, especially those young in the Lord, have been victimised time and time again in this matter of surrender or commitment. The bludgeon most commonly used is, The Lord Jesus gave his all for you. Now the least you can do is give your all for him. The believer is exhorted and pressured to consecrate, to surrender, to commit his life to Christ on the basis of his love and gratitude for what has been done on his behalf at Calvary. How often the average congregation is put through this routine. How often the individual believer is manoeuvred down to the front to consecrate and to re-consecrate, to surrender and to re-surrender, to commit and to recommit himself to Christ. Why is it that after a while the believers come to dread such meetings and such messages? Well, there are a number of reasons for all of these frustrations, flounderings and failures. And praise the Lord, there are scripture answers available to all who need or want them. First, it is utterly futile to expect a believer, by means of consecration, surrender or commitment, to step from his ground of substitution, Romans 3 verse 5, onto that of the deeper truths, that are found in Romans chapter 8 and chapter 12 verse 1. There is the all-important area of identification truth in Romans 6 and 7 that cannot be skipped over. Every hungry-hearted Christian yearns to be fully consecrated and conditioned for effective life and service. And from the outset, until hard experience teaches him otherwise, the well-meaning believer thinks that since he has the will to obey God and to be what God intends for him, he should attempt to carry it out through personal, consecrated effort with God's help and he seeks to struggle forward via the love motive. That is, he did for me, so I must do for him. The following are two thoughts by Andrew Murray, which will help us here. He writes... A superficial acquaintance with God's plan leads to the view that while justification is God's work by faith in Christ, sanctification or growth is our work to be performed under the influence of the gratitude that we feel for the deliverance that we have experienced and by the aid of the Holy Spirit. But the earnest Christian soon finds how little gratitude can supply the power. When he thinks that more prayer will supply it, he finds that, indispensable as prayer is, it isn't enough. Often the believer struggles hopelessly for years until he listens to the teaching of the Spirit as he glorifies Christ again and reveals Christ, our sanctification, to be appropriated by faith alone. In Philippians 2.13, we read that God works to will, 
and he's ready to work to do. But alas, many Christians misunderstand this. They think because they have the will, it's enough, and that now that they're able to do. But this is not so. The new will is a permanent gift, an attribute of the new nature. The power to do is not a permanent gift, but must be each moment received from the Holy Spirit. It is the man who is conscious of his own impotence as a believer who will learn that by the Holy Spirit he can lead a holy life. Now and then one is called on to speak out against something that is good in order to present God's best. The love motive for which to live the Christian life and serve the Lord is good, it's high, but it is not adequate, especially because it is not the motivation underwritten by God. As growing Christians, it is time for us to see the necessity of going beyond the love motive to the life motive. For me to live is Christ. Philippians 1.21 our consecration, surrender or commitment will never hold up if it is our responding to him from any other motivation than the response of his life in us. Yielding to him on any different basis will simply amount to our trying to live for him in the self-life. And even if that were possible, he could never accept it since in that realm there dwells no good thing, Romans 7 verse 18, plus the fact that he has already taken the old life to the cross and crucified it, Romans 6 6, Galatians 2 20, 2 Timothy 2 11, 1 Peter 2 24. J.C. Metcalf sees both the problem and the answer. He writes, the modern teaching of consecration, which is tantamount to the consecration of the old man, seeks to bypass the death sentence and therefore only leads to frustration and failure. When, however, you and I are prepared in simple humility to make the fact of our death with Christ our daily basis of life and service, there is nothing that can prevent the uprising and the outflowing of new life and meet the need of thirsty souls around us. Here is the crux of the matter. The question is, which life is to be consecrated to him? The old self-life or the new Christ life? God can accept absolutely nothing from the old. He sees and acknowledges only that which is centred in his Son, who is our life. Hence God has but one stipulation for consecration and that is yield yourselves unto God and those that are alive from the dead, Romans 6.13. This is our only ground and from this platform we are to count ourselves dead unto sin, to self, the law, the world and alive unto God in Christ, risen to walk in newness of life, that is risen life. Romans 6 verse 11. Present yourselves unto God as those alive from the dead. Romans 6 13. This is the true place of consecration. For believers to consecrate themselves to God ere they have learned their union with Christ in death and resurrection, which is identification, is only to present to God the members of the natural man which God cannot accept. Only those alive from the dead, that is, those having appropriated fully their likeness with him in death, are bidden to present their members as instruments unto God. In Romans 12 verse 1 we read this, God asks us to present our bodies as living sacrifices to him. Until we have done this, there is nothing else we can do. Notice this exhortation comes after Romans chapter 6. There is a reason for this order. Crucifixion comes before consecration. Uncrucified self refuses to be consecrated. This is why so many people 
with all sincerity, walk down the aisles again and again, consecrating uncrucified self to God. This is why the identification truths must be carefully and thoroughly presented, ultimately understood, and their reality entered into. We cannot even get as far as consecration without them. Many feel that identification is an emphasis, an interesting subject ministered at a few deeper life conferences or the Keswick conventions. But these truths are not peripheral, they are foundational. The sixth chapter of Romans is not an aspect of the truth, but the foundation truth upon which every believer must stand to know anything about victory. All the identification truths that we have learned about the cross, of our death with Christ, our death to sin with him, of our conformity to death like the grain of wheat falling into the ground to die, are preparatory to the overcoming life. They are the foundation of and fundamental to it. A careful study of all the epistles of Paul will show that they are written on the basis of the cross set forth in Romans chapter 6. The fact that God consigns the old fallen Adam life to the cross and has nothing to say to it. God deals with all believers on the ground that in Christ you died. But the Church of Christ as a whole ignores this fact. It treats the fallen creation or the self-life as capable of improvement. And so the meaning of the cross bringing to death the old Adam race as fallen beyond repair is thus nullified. Part 10. Self. One of the most important factors in Christian growth is the Holy Spirit's revelation of the self-life to the believer. Self is the fleshly, carnal life of nature, the life of the first Adam, dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2 verse 1, thoroughly corrupt before God, Galatians 5, 19 and 20, the life in which there is no good thing in the sight of God, Romans 7 verse 18. Nowhere do spiritual principles mean more than here. Plato with his know thyself was more right than he knew, but still only half right. Paul with God's not I but Christ was all right. For one to get beyond just knowing about the Lord Jesus and entering into a consistent and growing personal knowledge of and fellowship with him, one must first come to know oneself. Introspection isn't involved here. The Holy Spirit uses experiential revelation. First, the believer learns, not I. Then he believes, but Christ. First, we know that, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. Then, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. John 12, verse 24. Then again, first, always delivered unto death. Then, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 11. In service, it's first, death worketh in us, and then, but life in you. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 12. All resurrection life springs out of death, or else it would not be resurrection life, his risen life, Romans 6, verse 5 and 6. We are to yield ourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead, Romans 6, verse 13. For some years now, the evangelistic scene has been dominated by a conversion known as commitment, which often, sad to say, amounts to little more than a spiritual miscarriage. When there is a bit of life, it usually blossoms overnight into full bloom, 
but soon becomes heavy with fruit of dynamic, radiant personality coupled with busy, rushing service. Well, the tragedy of this sort of thing is that self is at home and thrives in the glow of it all and is rarely found out for what it really is. All is indiscriminate hearts and flowers. The healthy new birth, based on a deep conviction of sin and repentance towards God, starts out clear and strong with love and devotion to the Saviour. But before long there comes the sickening realisation of an element that pulls one back to self-centredness, to the world, to the rule of law, to sin. This learning by heartbreaking experience of the utter sinfulness and reigning power of self in the everyday Christian life is the means whereby we come to know the Lord Jesus beyond the birth phase as our Saviour and then on to the growing phase as our Lord and life. To me, to live is Christ. No believer will truly come to know the Lord Jesus as his life until he knows by experience the deadly sin life deep within for what it really is. As a spiritual life conference many years ago, Dr. C.I. Schofield said the following. He said, not everyone by any means has had the experience of the seventh of Romans, Romans chapter seven, that agony of conflict, of desire to do what we cannot do, of longing to do the right, but we find that we cannot do it. It is a great blessing when a person gets into the seventh of Romans and begins to realise the awful conflict of its struggle and defeat. Because the first step towards getting out of the struggle of Romans chapter 7 and into the victory of Romans chapter 8 is to get into the seventh chapter. Of all the needy classes of people, the neediest of this earth are not those who are having a heartbreaking, agonising struggle for victory, but those who are having no struggle at all and no victory and who do not even know it and who are satisfied and jogging along in a pitiable absence of almost all the possessions that belong to them in Christ. J.C. Metcalf gives this same fact an added witness by saying the following. Many a young Christian who has not been warned of this necessary voyage of discovery upon which the Holy Spirit will certainly embark him, that is Romans chapter 7, has been plunged almost into an incurable despair at the sight of the sinfulness which is his by nature. He has in the first place rejoiced greatly for the forgiveness of his sins and his acceptance by God. But sooner or later he begins to realise that all is not well and that he has failed and fallen from the high standard which he set himself to reach in the first flush of his conversion. He begins to know something of the experience which Paul so graphically describes in Romans 7 verse 15. What I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do, writes Paul. And in consequence, he feels that the bottom has fallen out of his Christian life. And then perhaps the devil whispers to him that, well, it's just no good him going on, because he will never be able to make the grade. Little does he know how healthy his condition is, and that this shattering discovery is but the prelude to a magnificent series of further discoveries of things which God has expressly designed for his eternal enrichment. All through life, God has to show us our utter sinfulness and need before he is able to lead us on into realms of grace in which we shall glimpse his glory. Self-revelation precedes divine revelation. That is the principle for both the spiritual birth and spiritual growth. The believer who is going through struggle and failure 
is the Christian who is being carefully and lovingly handled by his Lord in a very personal way. He is being taken through the experience, years in extent, through the experience of self-revelation and into death, the only basis upon which to know him, that's Jesus, to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. Philippians 3 verse 10. God works by paradox. Success comes by a failure. Life springs out of death and so on. The only element in the believer's life that crumbles is that which has to go away. The new life can never be harmed or affected. This disintegration is something the believer cannot enter into nor engineer on his own. Self will never cast out self. He has to be led into it by the mercy of the Holy Spirit. Led into failure. Abject and total failure. In 2 Corinthians 4.11 we read, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So often the means utilised by the Spirit is an unsaved mate, or even a saved one, or poor health, yes, or good health too. A thousand and one things are used by him. In fact, he uses everything. Romans 8, 28 and 29. He uses everything to bring out the worst in us, ultimately enabling us to see that the Christian life has to be not I, but Christ. People, circumstances and so on are never the cause of failure. Self's reaction to them is the cause. And the one problem to be dealt with, it's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord. Many of us have probably known what it was to rejoice in the grace of God without having apprehended very much the true character of the flesh. It's often been noted that where there is the greatest exuberance of joy in the young convert, there is often a levity which fails to take into account that the flesh is unchanged. In such cases, the grace of God is taken up in a self-confident way. There is very little self-distrust or sense of weakness and dependence. And the inevitable consequence is a fall or a succession of falls that gradually brings home to the consciences of believers their utter weakness and incapacity in the flesh. Evan Hopkins shares some important light on our subject. He writes, How infinite are the forms in which self appears. Some are occupied with good self. They pride themselves on their excellences. Others are just as much occupied with the bad self. They are forever groaning over their imperfections and struggling with the flesh as if they hope in time to improve it. When shall we be convinced that it is so utterly bad that it is beyond recovery? Our experience upward in the power of God is just in proportion to our experience downward in ceasing from self. What does Romans 6 verse 11 say? Is it, reckon yourself to be weak in reference to sin? No. Is it lower than that? Well, yes, it is. Is it, reckon yourself to be dying? No, it's lower still. Reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. Some believe they are very weak, but what does that imply? It implies that they have some strength, but when a man is dead he has no strength at all. We must act on the fact that we are dead in reference to sin. We shall not then speak of difficulty as to resisting temptation in reference to ourselves. We shall take the lowest place and say that it is impossible but we shall know that what is impossible with self is possible with God. We shall take our place on the resurrection side of the cross. 
And in so doing, we leave behind the old self for the new Christ life. To live in him who is our life is to be in the power of God. Someone has rightly said that there are many separated from the world Christians who are not separated from themselves Christians. 11. Self-denial. When a believer begins to discover something of the awful tyranny of the self-life, or has been endlessly struggling against that tyranny, he becomes intensely concerned about the denial of self with the resultant freedom to rest and grow in Christ. Man has many ways of seeking to escape the thraldom of self. God has but one way. First, then, some of these man-centred methods. The first man-centred method is mortification. Denying oneself certain things for a time, or even for all times, is not even close to the answer, since the old nature will adjust and thrive under any condition, anything short of death to itself. There have been those who have thought that to get themselves out of the way, it was necessary to withdraw from society. So they denied all natural human relationships and went into the desert or the mountains or the hermit's cell to fast and to labour and struggle to mortify the flesh. While the motive was good, it's impossible to commend this method. For it isn't scriptural to believe that the old Adam nature can be conquered in this manner. It yields to nothing less than death by the cross. It is altogether too tough to be killed by abusing the body or by starving the affections. The second man-centred method of self-denial is conquest. Probably the most drawn out and exhausting effort of all is the believer's struggle to conquer and control this rebel self. More meetings, more Bible studies, more prayer are all resorted to, but neither of these are God's answer to this problem. The next method of man-centred self-denial is training. Here is a favourite that's been tried and found wanting through the ages. Good Christian training and culture in the right homes and churches and schools have been relied upon to subdue the old nature and to bring it into line. Another method of self-denial is revivalism. Another failure that has been practised, holding special meetings once or twice a year, and this involves outside leadership that is a stranger to the individual problems and the devastating revival routine which is confession, new resolutions and so on and so forth in the hope that something will change but it rarely does and then not for very long. Another man-centred effort of self-denial is growth. So many dear Christians just keep plodding on or racing through deadening routines of the multitudinous church activities and duties, expecting that in time, self will change for the better as they grow. But self never changes into anything but more of the same. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Sometimes this self is entirely bad, as when it's angry, spiteful, unkind, unjust, untruthful, unloving, catty and so on. In other cases, a good exterior conceals an evil heart, as when we are proud of our humility, conceited about our Christian service, boastful of our orthodoxy. And often an over-forwardness and obvious conceit at the sound of one's own voice often spoils many a prayer meeting. Another method of self-denial by the world is cleansing. Up to the moment confession, and consequent cleansing have also constituted a popular method. However, 1 John 1 9 has to do with sins already committed and not with the source or self from which sins emanate. Our sins are dealt with by the blood. We ourselves are dealt with by the cross. The blood procures our pardon. The cross procures deliverance from what we are in Adam. The blood can wash away my sins. But it cannot wash away my old man. I need the cross to crucify me, the sinner.
Another way to try self-denial is experiences. Today, one of the prevalent attempts for something better is to go in for the baptism of the Spirit, speaking in tongues and so on. This is by far the most dangerous and the pathetic trap of all, as it's simply self, neurotically and religiously rampant. Calvary precedes Pentecost. Death with Christ precedes the fullness of the Spirit. Power. Yes, God's children need power. But God does not give power to the old creation, nor to the uncrucified soul. Satan will give power to the old Adam, but not God. Which of us does not know something of the failure of our ways, well-intentioned as they may be? What most do not know is that this very failure is the path to learning and entering into God's way. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now just what is God's way of self-denial? He has but one way, and it is on the basis of all his other ways, the principle of the finished work. His way for us in everything is the way that he has always travelled, conquered and completed in Christ. So God's way is the way of the cross. It was on the cross of Calvary that God in Christ dealt fully and finally with self, the nature from which all our sins flow. We know that our own unrenewed self was nailed to the cross with him in order that our body, which is the instrument of sin, might be made ineffective and inactive for evil, that we might no longer be slaves of sin. Romans 6 verse 6. The reason there is no other way for self to be denied is that God has done the work in this way. Our identification with Christ Jesus in his death and resurrection. It is done. Now it's ours to believe it. The flesh will only yield to the cross, not to all the resolutions you make at the conferences, nor to any self-effort, nor to any self-attempt to self-crucify. Only the co-crucifixion, that is, crucified together with Christ, as we read in Galatians 2.20. It is not by putting yourself to death, but by taking, through faith and surrender, your place of union with Christ in his death. That is the blessed barrier of safety between you and all the attractions of the flesh. And that makes the way open to do the will of God. The cross of Calvary resulted in the death of the Lord Jesus, both for sin and to sin, in that he died to sin. He died out of the realm of sin and he arose into the realm of newness of life, eternal life. And our identification with him on Calvary took us into death, down into the tomb and up into newness of life, as seen in Romans 6 verse 4. First, Romans 6 3, baptised into his death. Then Romans 6 4 buried with him. Then Romans 6, 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Also Colossians 3, verse 3, where we read, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Therefore Romans 6, verse 11 says, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise the Lord, it all happened at Calvary. Our sins were paid for, our sinfulness was dealt with, and both by the ultimate, death. And we receive the benefits of the work of the cross simply by reckoning on and believing in the finished work of the cross.
First, through the word, we find out what God did about our problem. Then, as we become thoroughly convinced of the fact and begin to understand it clearly, we're able to agree to reckon it to be true. And as we exercise faith in God's fact, we begin to receive the benefits of that finished work in experience. Was it not true in the matter of our justification? Yes, and we will likewise find it to be true in the matter of our emancipation from the slavery of the self-life. The powerful effect of the cross was God in heaven in the blotting out of guilt. And our renewed union with God is inseparable from the other effect, which is the breaking down of the authority of sin over man by the crucifixion of self. Therefore, scripture teaches us that the cross not only works out a disposition or desire to make such a sacrifice, but really bestows the power to do so and to complete the work. This appears with wonderful clarity in Galatians. In one place, the cross is spoken of as the reconciliation of guilt, chapter 3, verse 13. But there are three more places where the cross is even more plainly spoken of as the victory over the power of sin, as the power to hold in the place of death the I of the self-life, of the flesh, that is the outworking of self, and of the world, in Galatians 2.20, 5.24 and 6.14. In these passages, our union or our identification with Christ, the crucified one, and the conformity to him resulting from that union, are represented as the result of the power exercised within us and upon us by the cross. As we learn to stand on the finished work of Calvary, the Holy Spirit will begin to faithfully and effectively apply that finished work of the cross to the self-life, thereby holding it in the place of death, inactive, resulting in the, not I, but Christ life. Part 12, The Cross. Studying these truths is hard work, is it not? Although spiritual hunger and need are prime requisites for life and understanding, the Holy Spirit doesn't release the treasures of the word quickly nor easily. Deep calleth unto deep. We have to be prepared, and even then there's much time, diligence, praying, meditation, yearning and experience involved. True spiritual reality comes in no other way, but praise the Lord, it does come in this way. Understanding and appropriating the facts of the cross proves to be one of the most difficult and trying of all phases for the growing believer. Our Lord holds his most vital and best things in store for those who mean business, for those who hunger and thirst for his best, as it is in the Lord Jesus Christ. The believer's understanding of the two aspects of Calvary give the key to both spiritual growth and life-giving service. Calvary is the secret of it all. It is what he did there that counts, and what he did becomes a force in the life of a Christian when it is appropriated by faith. This is the starting point from which all godly living must take its rise. We shall never know the experience of Christ's victory in our lives until we're prepared to count, that is to reckon upon his victory at the cross as the secret of our personal victory today. There is no victory for us which was not first his victory. What we are to experience he purchased and what he purchased for us we ought to experience. The beginning of the life of holiness is a faith in the crucified Saviour which sees more than his substitutionary work. It is a faith which sees myself identified with Christ in both his death and his resurrection. 
Actually, our Father has trained every one of us for clear-cut, explicit faith in this second aspect of Calvary. Our individual identification with the Lord Jesus in his death to sin and rising to resurrection ground. This training taught us thoroughly in the first realm, believing and appropriating the finished work of his dying for our sins, which is justification. Now we are asked as definitely to believe and to appropriate the further aspect, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, Romans 6 verse 6. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, Romans 6 11. Our intelligent faith, standing on the facts of Calvary, gives the Holy Spirit freedom to bring that finished work into our daily lives. We stood on the fact of his dying for our sins. And this act of faith allowed the Holy Spirit to give us our freedom from the penalty of sin, justification. Now, once we come to see this further fact, we are urged in the word to stand on the liberating truth of our dying with Christ in his death to sin, which allows the Holy Spirit to bring into our lives freedom from the power freedom from the enslavement of sin, progressive sanctification. And of course, when we stand with him in glory, we will be forever free from the presence of sin, entirely sanctified and glorified. As our substitute, he went to the cross alone. He went without us to pay the penalty for our sins. He went as our representative. He took us with him to the cross, and there in the sight of God we all died together with Christ. We may be forgiven because he died in our stead. We may be delivered because we died with him. God's way of deliverance for us, a race of hopeless incurables, is to put us away in the cross of his Son, and then to make a new beginning by recreating us in union with him, the risen living one. 2 Corinthians 5.17 It is the Holy Spirit who will make these great facts real and true in our experience as we cooperate with him. And so the plague of our hearts will be stayed and we shall be transformed into the likeness of Christ. Through the crucifixion of the old man with Christ, the believer has been made dead unto sin. He has been completely freed from sin's power. He has been taken beyond sin's grip. The claim of sin upon him has been nullified. This is the flawless provision of God's grace. But the accomplished fact can only become an actual reality in the believer's experience as faith lays hold upon it and enables him moment by moment, day by day, though temptations assail him, to reckon it true. As he reckons, the Holy Spirit makes real. As he continues to reckon, the Holy Spirit continues to make real. Sin need have no more power over the believer than he grants it through unbelief. If he is alive unto sin, it'll be due largely to the fact that he has failed to reckon himself dead unto sin. The Reformation brought into focus once again the emphasis on spiritual birth, without which there can be no beginning. But what is lacking among believers to this day is the proper emphasis on growth. Not just to be saved with heaven by and by. What sort of salvation would we have if our Father simply saved us from the penalty of sin and then left us on our own to deal with the power of sin in our Christian life and walk? But most believers feel that this is about as far as God went. 
and they are struggling to get on as best as they can with his help. And this is the Galatian error, so prominent even now throughout born again circles. We must be brought back to the basics, freed from the penalty of sin by his finished work, freed from the power of sin by his finished work, justified by faith, Galatians 3.24. We walk by faith, 2 Corinthians 5.7. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, Colossians 2.6. We are not left to deal with the old life ourselves. It has been dealt with by Christ on the cross. This is the fact which must be known and a fact upon which is built the New Testament principle and doctrine of holiness. In other words, Calvary is as much the foundation of sanctification as it is of justification. Both gifts spring from the same work and both are two aspects of the same salvation. Now, as long as the believer doesn't know this dual aspect of his salvation, the best he can do is seek to handle his sins via confession, as in 1 John 1 9. That is dealing with it after the damage has been done. This takes care of the penalty of the product, but not the source. Is it not time we allowed the Holy Spirit to get at the source, to cut off the stream of sins before they are committed? Is it not infinitely better than the wreckage caused by sin, even though confessed? When believers get sick and tired of spinning year after year in spiritual squirrel cages, sinning, confessing, then sinning again, confessing, and then sinning again. Then they will be ready for God's answer to the source of sin, which is death to self, brought forth from the completed work of the cross. When God's light first shines in our heart, our one cry is for forgiveness, for we realise that we have committed sins before him. But once we have known forgiveness of sins, we make a new discovery the discovery of sin itself. And we realise that we have the nature of a sinner. There is an inward inclination to sin. There is a power within that draws us to sin. And when that power breaks out, we commit sins. We may seek and receive forgiveness, but then we sin again. And life goes on in this vicious circle, sinning and being forgiven but then sinning again. We appreciate God's forgiveness, but we want something more than that. We want deliverance. We need forgiveness for what we have done, but we need deliverance from what we are. Our reckoning on the finished work of our death to sin in Christ at Calvary is God's one way of deliverance. There is no other way, because this is the way that he did it. We learned not to add a finished work in the matter of justification, and now we must learn not to add to the finished work of emancipation. We will be freed when we enter his prepared freedom. There is no other. The believer can never overcome the old man, even by the power of the new apart from the death of Christ, and therefore the death of Christ unto sin is indispensable. And unless the cross is made the basis upon which he overcomes the old man, he only drops into another form of morality. In other words, he is seeking by self-effort to overcome self, and the struggle is a hopeless one. Marcus Rainford refused to stop short of God's ultimate for freedom. He said, It is not to be a mere passing impression of the mind when we are undisturbed by active temptation. No mere happy frame of spirit when under temporary refreshing from the presence of the Lord. 
no self-flattering consciousness of a heart exercised in good works. From none of these is the believer to infer in his practice of mastery over sin, but on the grounds that Christ died unto sin, and he liveth unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I must recognise that the enemy within the camp, that is the flesh, the old sin nature, self, I, the old Adam, I must recognise that the enemy within the camp is a usurper. By faith, I must reckon him to be in the place that God put him, that is crucified with Christ. I must realise that now my life is hid with Christ in God, that he is my life. 13. Discipleship A disciple is one who first maintains the fellowship of the cross, which results in fellowship with his Lord. Discipleship. The atonement of the cross and the fellowship of the cross must be equally preached as the condition of the true disciple. Christ is the answer, but the cross is needed to clear the way for him. In spiritual progress, our Lord never pushes. He is our file leader. Hebrews 12 verse 2. And he leads us step by step. We struggle and fail through self-effort, which sets up a yearning for the answer to this depressing failure. In time, we see the scriptural facts of deliverance in the cross through identification, and that in turn produces the required hunger to enter into that freedom. Freedom for fellowship with the answer, our risen Lord Jesus. Nothing can set us apart from God. Nothing can make us holy except the cross at work in us because the cross alone can keep the hindrances to holiness in the place of death. At the back of all successful work for the lost is an inward spiritual impulse and back of that impulse is the Holy Spirit who reproduces Christ in us and the brand mark of it all is the cross the living experience of which must both enter and control the life before we are fit for service. Nowhere was our Lord Jesus more explicit and firm than when he mentioned discipleship. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Luke 9 verse 23 and chapter 14 verse 27. His reason for this is simple. Self cannot and will not follow him. But taking one's cross results in death to self and newness of life in Jesus Christ. A disciple is one who is free from the old and free for the new. In other scriptural words, dead unto sin, but alive unto God. See Romans 6 verse 11. And for this the Lord Jesus states that each must take up his cross. So now to the how. But first, how not to take up one's cross. Christians need to understand that bearing the cross does not in the first place refer to the trials, which we call crosses, but to the daily giving up of life, to dying to self, which must mark us as much as it did the Lord Jesus, which we need in times of prosperity almost more than adversity, and without which the fullness of the blessing of the cross cannot be disclosed to us. May we cease to confuse the words a cross with the cross. Sometimes believers in self-pity bemoan themselves and they say, oh, I have taken up or I must take up my cross and follow Jesus. Would that we would lose sight of our cross in his cross. Then his cross becomes our cross. His death, our death. His grave, our grave. And his resurrection, our resurrection. Our resurrection. 
his risen life, our newness of life. No, taking up our cross does not mean a stoical bearing of some heavy burden or hardship, illness, a distasteful situation or relationship. Enduring anything of this nature is not bearing one's cross. Taking up the cross may or may not involve such things, but things do not constitute our cross. The believer's cross is the cross of Calvary, the cross on which he was crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. There the eternal emancipation proclamation was signed with the blood of the Lamb and sealed by the Spirit of God. Every believer is thereby freed from all bondage, but every believer is not aware of this liberating truth. Sad to say, the only believers who are interested in freedom are those who have come to the place of hating instead of hugging their chains. It is true that the intellect is stumbled by the cross, and yet the antagonism to the cross is mainly moral, both in the sinner and in the saint, for its message is only welcomed by those who desire freedom from the bondage of their sins and who hunger and thirst after experiential righteousness of God. Yes, the need must be intense, as Norman Doughty says. The divine way, that is via the cross, the divine way for spiritual emancipation is just as offensive to the child of God as the divine way for salvation is to the lost. When the believer begins really to see the cross for what it is, a place of death, he is inclined to hesitate about choosing such fellowship. Our Lord Jesus understands this well, but, but there is no other way, since that is the manner in which he finished the work on our behalf. So he simply allows our needs to continue their relentless pressure until we finally bend. We will be ready to take up our cross when self becomes intolerable to us, when we begin to hate our life. In Luke 14, verse 26, it says, and hate not his own life and cannot be my disciple. The deep burden of self and hunger to be like him caused the function of the cross, crucifixion, to become attractive. The long, devastating years of abject bondage make freedom in the Lord Jesus priceless. The cost becomes as nothing to us. Think of it. We begin to share the attitude of our Lord Jesus and of Paul. For the joy that was set before him, the Lord Jesus patiently endured the cross. Hebrews 12 too. The attitude of the Apostle Paul became this. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 6.14 And in Philippians 2.5 we read, Let this mind or this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Yes, we begin to glory in the cross, our very own freedom from all that enslavement, from all that would keep us from fellowship with the risen Lord. And so we begin to take up our cross, our liberation, our personal finished work, held in trust for us so long and patiently by the Holy Spirit. Talk about your trust fund. And here is how we take up and bear our cross. Finally prepared by our need, aware that our bondage was broken in Christ on Calvary, we definitely begin to rely on that finished work. We appropriate. Our attitude becomes, I gladly and willingly take by faith in the facts my finished work of emancipation that was established at Calvary. I consider myself to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. This is taking up one's cross. As we learn to do this, we begin to find these facts true in experience. The Holy Spirit brings that finished work of death and applies it to all of our old nature, which is thus held in the place of death. 
the death of Calvary. If and when we turn from the facts and begin to rely on anything or anyone else, including ourselves, self is released from the cross. It becomes active and enslaving as ever. Through this process, we are patiently taught to walk by faith, to maintain our attitude of reliance on the finished work of the cross. Adolf Sapphire wrote the following. He said, the narrow path commencing with the cross, ye have died with Christ, and ending with the glory of the Lord Jesus is the path on which the Lord draws near and walks with his disciples. Christ liveth in me. The Lord within lives as the sole source of life. The old I has no contribution. He can make to the Christian life and service. He can never be harnessed to the purposes of God. Death is his decreed portion. There cannot be two masters in our lives. If the old I is an active possession of us, then Christ cannot be. But if we gladly take hold of the great fact of redemption, I have been crucified with Christ, then Christ by his spirit takes up the exercise of the function of life within us and leads us as his bond slaves, as his disciples in the train of his triumph.